Okay, good morning. Uh, we will start the webinar in one minute. Mo, can you hear me? Yes, Dimitri is uh, looking at the time. It is, uh, I think, 11 a.m., correct? Yes. Uh, before uh, Dimitri gives uh, introductory words, uh, we are recording this session. Uh, thank you for joining us, everyone. Um, you'll notice there is a chat window, and uh, the audience will be muted during the presentation. Presentation is recorded. And uh, if you have any questions at any time, uh, please type it in the chat window and it will be addressed at the end uh, during a 10-minute uh, uh, Q&A. So thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Dimitris, uh, please go ahead and start. Yep, good morning and good afternoon for those of you joining us from the US and Europe. On behalf of the Charlton Group and our partners at IOTCO, I would like to thank you for giving IOTCO the opportunity to share the benefits of implementing Industry 4.0 initiatives in your factories using artificial intelligence-based predictive analytics with our focus being predictive maintenance and predictive quality. Our vision is to assist you in achieving a zero downtime, zero defect manufacturing operation and with that, I would like to introduce to you Dr. Mo Abuali, who is the CEO and managing partner at IOTCO. Mo? Dimitris, thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, we're, uh, we're very proud and privileged to be working with the Charlton Group and to assist uh, Charlton customers and partners uh, to use artificial intelligence technology and improve their uh, shop floor productivity. Uh, my name is Mo. I'm, I'm located in Cincinnati, Ohio. and uh, I've been in the industry for over 20 years. Uh, in my past, I've worked at uh, companies like Toyota in Georgetown, Kentucky. I was part of their maintenance organization uh, over 15 years ago. And uh, at that time, back in maybe 96, 97, uh, we were doing connectivity to robotics and uh, predictive maintenance algorithms and even tying that information back to the IBM Maximo maintenance system of Toyota. So uh, it's, it's been a great journey. And uh, together with the Charlton Group, uh, we've, we've partnered to bring this solution that was proven in companies like Toyota to the market and, and to, the, uh, to the manufacturing industry. Um, so during the presentation, I'm, I will go ahead and uh, stop my video uh, to save you know, any bandwidth issues. And we will focus on the presentation that you should be able to see uh, the first slide. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please type them in the chat window and they'll be addressed in the last uh, 10 minutes of the presentation. So um, who is IOTCO, the Internet of Things company? Uh, just one slide to be very brief. Um, our DNA is the automotive industry. Uh, we, uh, as a company, um, have projects running in automotive OEMs and tier one suppliers who are using our artificial intelligence and predictive analytics solutions to drive improvement. Uh, but we also work in other industries, uh, including aerospace, uh, heavy industry, discrete, and oil and gas. Um, our domain of experience is around smart factory and smart product. So using analytics uh, to drive uh, the use of artificial intelligence uh, to improve uh, factory operations and the critical assets within the factory. But some of our analytics can also be deployed in products in the field uh, to offer remote monitoring and remote diagnostic services. Uh, so the analytics may be the same, but obviously the audience is different. Within the smart factory, which is going to be the focus of my presentation today, uh, we're focusing on 
you know, empowering the maintenance organization and empowering the manufacturing team and management to uh, drive OEE and, and to reduce uh, unplanned downtime and defects on the factory floor. Uh, we go to market with three practices. Uh, we have a consulting and a data science and an automation team, okay? Uh, they work together to deliver a turnkey solution to the client. Uh, the product that I'll be sharing today, and I'll be sharing it in the form of case studies from the industry, uh, is called PDX. It is a predictive analytics solution using artificial intelligence and machine learning to, uh, to drive uh, uptime and maintenance and quality improvements for the most critical assets on the shop floor. Um, you know, hand in hand with the PDX solution, we have an academy which delivers the education and the training. Uh, we also partner with universities like the University of Cincinnati uh, here where I am, and we actually offer online courses and certifications uh, regarding Industry 4.0. Um, and lastly, we have a connectivity team uh, because the biggest challenge is usually how do I get the data and how do I maybe add sensors to the process to drive my predictive analytics. So this is why we have an automation team who have a very strong uh, controls engineering background and we're able to help you create that data lake within your manufacturing environment in order to drive the predictive analytics. Uh, so this is us, and uh, again, we are partnering with organizations like uh, Charlton Group to uh, bring these solutions to the market. So my agenda today is, is threefold. Um, I'd like to first talk and make some definitions around what is the industrial Internet of Things, what is uh, Industry 4.0, and what's the role of predictive analytics, and really to focus on the business case. And this, these are true business cases from our clients to justify their investments in these solutions. Uh, second, I would like to give several case studies from our technology and some of our key solution templates. Uh, this includes industrial robots, it includes stamping, and includes uh, casting operations, just to give you a, a flavor of how predictive analytics is deployed in those areas. And then we will conclude with. Uh, a very systematic approach of how you can gain ROI quickly with AI. And uh, Dimitris and myself will have a Q&A and, and several questions can also be answered from, uh, from the audience using the chat window. So let's start. Um, again, our vision here is to assist manufacturers to use predictive analytics and AI solutions to achieve uh, the vision of a zero downtime, zero defect operation, okay? This is actually uh, ZDZD, if you notice. This was actually the acronym that we used to use at Toyota about 15 years ago. So the, uh, the message is still the same, but of course, uh, you know, computational power and, and analytics and, and algorithms and all these things have evolved over the years, and they've become much easier now to use and to deploy in a manufacturing environment. So let's start. IoT. Internet of Things is, uh, is by no means a new field. This has been around for many years, maybe under different namings. Uh, but you know, in safety critical industries like uh, monitoring of power plants or monitoring of jet engines, um, these have been in existence for decades. So collecting data, analyzing that data, and making sure that safety critical environments you know, are running with a high level of safety and a high level of, of uptime. Uh, a lot of these thoughts and, and techniques and methodologies are now being adopted in the manufacturing environment. So when we talk about industrial IoT, we're talking about looking within the factory and collecting data from multiple layers. Uh, those layers include the machine layer, which is obviously your CNCs and PLCs and sensors on the factory floor. Uh, some organizations have SCADA systems in place, which are data acquisition systems that are collecting parameters from the assets. Some organizations have manufacturing execution systems, MES, which are kind of bridging the gap between the factory floor and your business system, your enterprise resource planning system. So the role of predictive analytics is 
adding further value to those layers and using your machine layer and SCADA data for the purpose of predictive maintenance and what we refer to as predictive quality, okay? So predictive analytics is very complementary to the existing layers on your factory floor and to the existing systems that you might be using today to operate your manufacturing uh, factories. And there comes Industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 is an initiative which was initially born out of Germany. And it defines that we have entered the era of the fourth industrial revolution where information technology, IT, is converging with operational technology, OT. And this convergence between IT and OT is allowing the use of new technologies like predictive analytics to drive further value from these layers of machine data collection and MES that you guys see here on, in the pyramid. So when we talk about helping clients with their digital or analytics journey or strategy, we're talking very simply about four things. And in many cases, we start from the right and go backwards. We talk first about the ROI, and I'll demonstrate to you several business cases of clients who have used predictive analytics to achieve significant ROI in a short period of time. Then we talk about what level of connectivity do I have on the factory floor? Uh, do I have a data lake in place? Uh, am I getting real-time data from my assets? Do I need to add sensors to the machine? I have new machines, I have legacy old machines, how do I connect to those? So these are questions that we answer when we talk about connectivity. And once the connectivity is in place, we deploy the analytics. We deploy predictive analytics with AI and ML based on solution templates like robotics, casting, machining, and stamping, which we will show you today. And lastly, once this is proven in a smaller scale environment, we talk about scaling that technology and using that template to roll out the solution across similar assets in multiple manufacturing environments or multiple manufacturing plants. So keeping this in mind, let's talk about the business case. When we talk about smart factory, which is the focus of this presentation, we're talking about helping and improving the bottom line of your business operations. And one of the key metrics you may use to run your factory today is overall equipment effectiveness or OEE. And the first key metric within OEE that, that impacts the uptime of your assets is obviously your utilization metric. But when we look at predictive maintenance solutions, we're also looking at how can you detect and reduce unplanned downtime. So moving from a reactive manufacturing or reactive maintenance environment to a proactive and predictive maintenance environment. Second, we also look at how can I optimize and maybe reduce the maintenance spare part inventory. Because if my predictive insights can tell me that this robotic, for example, is going to fail in the next two to three weeks, I have a heads up that may allow me to reduce that spare part inventory and then to uh, obviously reduce that overhead so I can order spare parts just in time before the asset actually fails. Okay. And this may require tie into your maintenance system, for example. We have many clients where the predictive insights are flowing into their maintenance system, like a, an IBM Maximo or an SAP PM, and those predictive uh, metrics are helping them not just improve spare parts, but also optimize their maintenance schedule. Right now, many, many clients or many manufacturers, they have a time-based, uh, more reactive maintenance or preventive maintenance schedule. So by using predictive data, we can optimize labor for maintenance required, and we can also schedule maintenance in a proper way, knowing uh, heads up information on when maintenance may be required on a specific machine, right? So when we translate this to numbers, um, these are average or minimum uh, impacts on these smart factory metrics that you see on the left from different clients that we have worked with in the past and also based on studies in the field, you know, studies by, uh, you know, organizations, consulting organizations like Accenture or McKinsey, right? 
So OEE gains with predictive analytics have been at minimum five to 20%. Uh, utilization or uptime gains, which is part of the OEE metric have been at minimum five to 10%. Um, you know, integrating with the maintenance environment and helping to reduce spare parts on hand has impacted manufacturers by, by reducing spare parts by at least 10%. Um, interestingly, uh, labor time reduction uh, by, by optimizing maintenance activities has been somewhere between 5 to 25% at minimum. And, and the fact that organizations uh, that we've also worked with have been able to eliminate overhead maintenance and even eliminate weekend maintenance, which they might have to do, um, you know, kind of uh, late in the game uh, to try to fix their maintenance schedule. So these are just some of the key metrics that are used today to drive the business case around predictive maintenance. This is actually one of the first um, predictive maintenance applications that we did with an automotive OEM on their industrial robots. And that was actually the business case behind it. Uh, this was almost a decade ago. Um, this automotive OEM facility had 500 robotics. And at the time, the average cost of one minute of downtime was $10,000. I mean, it, it is quite high in this environment because obviously they're not making cars, right? Um, when we deployed the solution and, and we looked at the maintenance records, we, you know, we realized that robotics may not fail often, right? You, in one year, maybe only 30 robotics actually fail uh, due to an unplanned way. Um, and, but however, when they do fail, 30 minutes of downtime is a typical unplanned downtime period for the robot to be fixed. So translating that to dollars and, and deploying a predictive analytics solution uh, where you know, there, there's an under promise prediction, I would say, that we're only predicting 50% of the actual failures. Uh, in real life, by the way, you know, predictions can go up to 80 to 90%. But if we're taking such a low estimate of the prediction capability, this factory truly hit the annual savings that you see here by deploying a, a predictive maintenance uh, solution and strategy for their industrial robots, okay? Um, again, this is looking strictly at uptime. There is no uh, inclusion here of a spare part impact or you know, preventive maintenance labor impact. It is strictly a simple calculation based on uh, you know, detecting and predicting unplanned downtime before it happens. Um, going a little bit deeper into uh, two more use cases, and then we will revisit the technology uh, behind them. Um, these are two tier one automotive suppliers, and uh, they, they are lighthouse clients, I would say, that we work with uh, on a daily basis. Um, you know, the key value that predictive analytics and, and our IoT code technology brings to manufacturers can really be seen in, in, four, uh, in four ways or four layers. So first, what is the value to the user? Uh, usually it's a technical value. What is the, the velocity? So how quick have I been able to deploy this technology? Um, how quick am I able to scale it? And what is the overall return on investment from piloting the technology and rolling out the technology? Okay, so if we look at those four metrics, which, which kind of judge and justify the, the power of predictive analytics and the ROI behind it, we look at a company like Maxion Wheels, that is a, a $3 billion company, Brazilian headquartered, maybe 25 different plants around the world. Uh, steel manufacturing of wheels and aluminum manufacturing of wheels. So there are two divisions. When we look at the value of the deployment in, a, in one of their smaller factories in Akron, Ohio, um, they were able to connect sensors to a very legacy machine. So these machines are truly from the 1960s. Um, they're still running. They're making wheels every nine to 10 second cycle time. Um, but, you know, spare parts are tough to get because uh, when it fails, uh, you know, spare parts for an older machine are difficult to obtain. Uh, so by using predictive analytics and working with us to sensorize their machine, they were able to receive data from a very old piece of equipment. They were able to use analytics to understand and detect faults early on the machine and use that to integrate with their maintenance system and order a new spare part for that machine 
before it actually fails. And the solution is giving them at least a two to three week heads up. It's a two to three week prediction window where they can actually optimize their PM and make spare part orders. Uh, the velocity of deploying such a solution is uh, we, we operate by deploying templates. So they have hundreds of assets, but there are seven categories of machines that are most critical to their operation. Uh, those categories include a, a CNC machine that spins the wheel, for example, or a flow forming machine that uh, kind of forms the wheel, right? So by defining the critical templates within your manufacturing facility, the deployment of the template with, with these pre-configured templates or analytics was actually within eight to 12 weeks, within less than three months, the templates were deployed in a pilot setting and at this moment of time, there is a rollout strategy of those templates to similar plants. They have 10 plants uh, within steel wheel operations that should be going live in the next, I would say, two years. Um, what is the ROI? Typical ROI we see from a pilot investment in predictive analytics is usually six months. And a typical plant level ROI we would see is typically within 12 months. And it's, it's very important to, to have a strategy behind ensuring those ROIs and tracking the ROIs uh, on a weekly or monthly basis. The Bocar Group is a different type of organization. Um, our use case here is what we call predictive quality. So this is the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to correlate the machine data in, into the quality or the part data that is being produced on the machine. So in high pressure die casting, um, it's, it's really a big data project. There is 40 to 50 process parameters that are being collected in real time from a die cast machine. And the cycle times are somewhere between six to 10 seconds where the AI has to actually make a decision. And um, we sometimes refer to this as prescriptive analytics because you are prescribing using the AI to the die cast machine if this is actually going to be a good cast, a good part or a bad part, and you can prescribe to the cast machine to automatically reject the part, for example. But the AI must make decisions very quickly within a six to 10 second period of time, right? So the value here is strictly around how can I reduce scrap in my casting operation? And a 1% scrap reduction actually in a medium sized casting operation is almost 250K per plant per year in annual savings. And we'll go deeper into now the technology that's behind these two case studies and how the data collection happens and the connectivity and the AI. But it was important first to paint the picture around what is the business case that drives the technology adoption in your operation. Um, just as an FYI, the uh, uh, North American Manufacturers Association, NAM, uh, has an AI leadership award that they started giving out last year. And in fact, Maxion Wheels was the only automotive client in 2019 to receive that award. And uh, this year, the predictive quality application at Bocar also received that award. So there is a lot of recognition that today, especially by NAM and other organizations, of how AI can be used to uh, drive improvement in manufacturing. So now that we've uh, set the stage for the business case, I wanna go through some quick case studies to give you the feeling of how this technology works. And I'd like to start here. Um, so the solution is PDX and the vision behind it is how can I use analytics to achieve a worry-free manufacturing process? A worry-free manufacturing process has a vision of zero downtime and a zero defect operation. So when we architect such a solution, there is three stages or, or three tiers, three layers. The first layer is, do I have the data to drive the analytics? And if I do not, how can we create that data lake? The second is ingesting that data into the industrial AI solution templates. We have over 25 templates within our library, and I'll show three or four of them today as an introduction. Then once that solution template is, is selected and connected to the factory floor, we talk about the use cases. 
um, that, that drive the use of the data to the business case. So when we look at a solution like this, we're talking about collecting data from the CNC itself, from the PLC. In some cases, we have to uh, sensorize the machine, especially when the machine is quite old. Uh, some of the templates may require uh, add-on sensors like vibration, for example. So we have a sensor team that is able to add the vibration se uh, sensors on specific areas of the machine. Uh, when we talk about correlating the data to quality, right? So when we look at the use cases, predictive maintenance and predictive quality, we're talking about collecting data from, uh, from your inspection equipment. For example, you might have a camera that is taking a picture of the part. Uh, you might have an x-ray machine, you might have uh, some automated uh, quality inspection device, which we can use to correlate the quality data back to the machine data, right? So then the, the industrial AI solution is, is able uh, to, to connect and ingest that data and do something with that data. And I'll describe in the next slide what we do with it and how we do it. And then drive the use case that makes sense. So in predictive maintenance, we're focusing on the machine. So we're focusing on what is the health of the asset and what is the remaining useful life prediction of when this asset might fail before it fails. And obviously every prediction has an accuracy to it. So it's important to understand that accuracy level. Um, and then diagnostics. So if I'm looking at a robotic, for example, which axis or component of the robotic might fail, okay? And if I'm, if I'm looking at a, um, a bearing on a spindle on a CNC machine, you know, which temperature parameter may lead to the failure of the bearing, right? Or is it the outer race of my be bearing failing or is it my inner race of my bearing, right? So diagnosis can be kind of component level diagnosis, but it can also be process level diagnosis, okay? And then once the data is mapped in some environments to the quality metrics, like in casting, Casting is more of a scrap rich environment. So industry standard in a casting plant is maybe nine to 10% scrap. And, and in some cases that's, that's taken as an, ad, an adequate level of, of quality. But just reducing that scrap rate by 0.5% or 1% can lead significant uh, ROI and, and savings for the end user. So here we're looking at what is the health of the actual part that is being produced on the machine. Green, yellow, red, is this part going to be healthy, predicted healthy? Is it a suspect part that you should reject and investigate? Or is it red means it is predicted to be a defect with a high level of accuracy, so please reject that part immediately and investigate, right? So these are what we refer to as predictive analytics metrics. And obviously those metrics require that data lake flowing into the AI engine. And then there is a, an intuitive user interface that can be used by a, a maintenance person, right? To drive those decisions or a quality person. So this is the process upon which um, all the solution templates are built, okay? So if I'm looking at a robotic or a stamping machine or a casting machine, within each one of those templates is a pre-configured approach to, to define the data model. So we know specifically what data parameters are to be captured from the PLC of the machine, from the controller, or from add-on sensors that I would add to the machine. We have machine learning algorithms that take that data and process it. So signal processing, extracting statistics, which are called features or metrics from the data, and then training a health assessment model, okay? And all the health assessment models are data-driven. So we, we create a fingerprint. So this is a fingerprint of what is the baseline of the, of the machine now? What is the current baseline? And then we trend that baseline over time, okay? And obviously the AI must be able to learn what is a healthy condition, what is a warning level condition, what is a failure level condition, right? So there is uh, baseline data required to train the models. And in many cases, we, we find uh, it's sufficient with two to four weeks of baseline data to train a health assessment model with a high level of accuracy. Once, once the model is trained, okay, um, predictions uh, can start to occur, but, but obviously predictions require more historical data. 
initially the prediction accuracy may be lower. Uh, there might be a higher rate of false alarms, but as more data is collected, the prediction accuracy can start to reach you know, near 95% confidence interval. And then diagnosis, diagnosis meaning which part of the robot is gonna fail or which part of the bearing is gonna fail. Uh, or if I tell you this, this casted part is gonna be a bad or a defect part, what is the diagnosis for that? Is it a, a temperature signal spiking? Is it a pressure signal? Is it my oil temperature spiking, right? So component diagnosis and process diagnosis is key to investigate what is the root cause of that predicted failure that is, that is going to happen. So now if you take those six steps and imagine that they exist in each one of those solution templates I'm about to show, we have a library of almost 25 solution templates that are proven, that are studied well, that are well thought out, and that can be deployed in a manufacturing environment fairly quickly and cost effectively. And it starts with robotics. Um, I'll show an example of how we do uh, servo motor access monitoring on a robot. Um, no sensors are required. You can get the data directly from each of the joints or the access of the robotic. Um, we'll show an example on CNC machine tools, specifically looking, for example, at the spindle bearing where a vibration sensor may be required to mount on the spindle bearing housing on a CNC machine. You can also use that data to monitor the tool. So you can monitor the unbalance or the chatter vibration on a tool. Um, there is also a template for the ball screw or the feed axis. Um, which actually does not require any sensors. There are controller data that you can get from a CNC machine uh, control, and you can use that to predict uh, if a ball screw is having a lubrication issue or a starvation issue. Um, interestingly, we're seeing more interest around the coolant, the lubrication system, and there are sensors that are able to measure the pH level and other chemical characteristics of the coolant and allow us to make predictions on, on the health of the coolant and, and when you may need to actually change the lubrication on the machine. Um, again, just examples. Uh, we do a lot of work in casting and most of the casting work is relating to predictive quality. So high pressure casting applications, uh, low pressure casting applications. Um, stamping operations, we'll show an example uh, of an automotive uh, tier supplier. Uh, who used uh, controller data from the stamping, and we used that data to drive uh, a very successful predictive maintenance of, of key areas of the stamping machine. Um, we also have, have some non-intrusive approaches, even using the sound, using acoustic data from the stamping machine to predict issues on the die itself and also on the part that is being stamped on the machine. Um, and the ancillary equipment, so all the surrounding components around the factory or around the machine, right? So you have your building management systems like compressors and chillers. Uh, you have pumps, motors, and valves, right? Um, so within each one of those gray boxes here, uh, there are three characteristics. The first characteristic is the connectivity and the artificial intelligence and machine learning workflow which is that six step process we showed on the previous slide is pre-built and pre-configured. What is required from the client side is the data needs to be there or the connectivity needs to be there. And if it is not, this is something where our automation team can support to, to help accelerate the deployment of, of the AI on the factory floor. But if the machines are already connected and data is already flowing, you know, such an AI template can go live in a period of about eight to 12 weeks with a trained baseline and with a running solution on the factory floor and, and a maintenance organization that can start then to use those predictive data to drive decision making uh, and improvement. And then everything is offered is an analytics as a service. Um, there is a subscription approach where you can subscribe to these templates or these apps based on the needs of the factory and it could be a, a per asset per year or a per factory per year analytics service that includes the software and the support required to to get you connected and, and to drive the analytics uh, to, to your maintenance organization.
So I'm going to pick a few and I'm going to very quickly show you case studies and how the solution looks. And I'm going to start before I do that, just to give you a feeling of how the solution is actually implemented. Um, for those who are interested to, to, to know more details, there is really two sources of data. There is your controller data, and then there are sensors that may be needed to add like vibration on a spindle for specific templates. Um, obviously, the, the controller data and the sensor data flow into the first module of our solution, which is called DAQ, data acquisition. Uh, we can also do what's called edge analytics. So this can be sitting in the factory and we can do edge computing and we can do some algorithms and analytics right here within the DAQ module in the plant. And then the, the metadata, like the health and the features and the predictions can flow out to your application server, which is called deploy. And, and again, all the ownership of the data and the ownership of the infrastructure is the clients, okay? So you have full ownership of the data and the analytics and you can deploy it on-premise or within the private cloud of your manufacturing uh, uh, corporate strategy. So th the reason we do it this way is, you know, with the big data we're collecting from the factory floor, which might include vibration data, we are able to here uh, make sense of the data very quickly within DAQ and then drive the results to your maintenance organization through a web-based solution. Um, and I'll be showing you know, quite a few screenshots of the solution for, for different templates. So let's, let's start with industrial robots, okay? I'm gonna show two slides or at the most three on some of the key templates that we have. Let's start here. Um, so, so obviously with predictive maintenance, we cannot solve all problems. We can solve specific problems, right? And this is a good chart that clearly shows some of the key failure modes that our predictive solution can, can help you uh, catch early and predict early. Uh, that includes things regarding the motor, uh, the encoder, the brakes, the backlashes, maybe lubrication, right? But of course, uh, using predictive maintenance does not mean you should stop doing your PM cycle. Of course, we will uh, you know, optimize your PM cycles, but pre preventive maintenance is obviously still required on uh, the robot to complement the predictive maintenance effort. It is important to state that, you know, first, such a solution is agnostic to the type of robot and the type of manufacturer, okay? So if it's a FANUC robotic or if it's a KUKA, if it's a Denso, if it's an ABB, uh, a, a solution template should be able to capture the data and run the analytics regardless of the type or age of robotic. The second advantage is the solution is, is non-intrusive, meaning you do not need to add sensors on the robotic, okay? We can capture torque, we can capture speed, angular, so there's a defined data model for each of the axes of the robotic, and this can be done uh, uh, quite simply, actually, uh, on FANUC and KUKA robots, for example, um, and this allows the data to flow to the maintenance uh, supervisors uh, with an intuitive uh, web-based, mobile-based health dashboard um, and driving analytics for the overall robot itself and each of the axes of the robotic, okay, and generating predictions. So what could it look like? It could look like something like this, right? So, so obviously the um, end user here is not a PhD and not a data scientist, right? It's the maintenance organization. So an intuitive health dashboard for maintenance is, is crucial. What you see here is the health of each robotic in the factory. Uh, this is a real example from an automotive tier one where we are allowed to show it publicly. Um, what you see here is your health metric. So green is your baseline, yellow is your degradation level, and red is your failure level. And the AI model is able to automatically detect and, and set these thresholds for you. Okay, so they're, they're adaptive. They change over time based on the data that is being collected. Um, as, as long as your health value, one of those green dots is close to green, your baseline, you obviously have not drifted away from the baseline and you have a healthy robotic, okay? In this case, there's an obvious degradation on the robot and the health point has hit near warning. So the solution can send out predictive alerts, okay? 
Um, those alerts can be sent out by text or by email. They can interface with your maintenance system also to create uh, PM work orders or predictive tickets, we call them. Um, here is your remaining useful life prediction. So, you know, over here, I'm gonna fail as a prediction, but there is a window to it. So this is your prediction accuracy. So we have many clients who take a more cautious view to this. So they would take the lower end of the prediction tail, maybe buffer it by the time it needs to order a spare part, for example, or optimize a PM cycle. And then at this point, they would uh, have a pre preventive maintenance ticket, work order ticket, to actually have someone go out and fix the robotic. So now the question becomes which part of the robotic may actually fail. And this is where we have a diagnosis that clearly indicates which joint or axis of the robot may fail so that instead of me uh, going in and maybe replacing all the six joints, which is usually a standard maintenance approach, that you, know, you can reduce the labor time on the maintenance uh, by fixing a specific joint that's gonna fail. And you can also tie this to your spare part system so you can order a spare part early before the machine actually fails. Of course, behind the scenes, there is validation. So you can click, you can go deeper, you can look at the torque value, you can look at the angular measurement value. So the process engineers can also validate that the predictive solution is, is giving the right information uh, to the maintenance team. Then you have CNC machines, okay? With CNC machines, um, it, it is a more complex asset and a more complex environment with multiple templates. So you have the tool, you have the ball screw, you have the coolant system, you have the spindle bearing, right? We define what's called a machine tool health index, okay? And the machine tool health index combines the health indices of the key critical components on the machine. And we need to understand, are we looking at the predictive maintenance side or are we looking at the predictive quality side? For example, we have clients that measure the uh, surface roughness or surface texture uh, on the part that they're producing. And we're actually making uh, correlations between the machining health of each of those components to the actual part that is being produced. And we're predicting that you might have a, a surface roughness measurement that is, uh, that is off spec, for example, right? So defining the business case behind the predictive analytics here is important. And then that drives the um, selection of the critical components and the deployment. So very quickly, what is the data model? Um, here is an example, right? So on the spindle bearing, for example, there is a vibration sensor. Um, the motor current and the spindle speed parameters are captured directly from the controller. And uh, there are different drivers to do that directly from the machine control. Um, this is an example of a maintenance health dashboard. So look and feel is similar, right, between all the templates, but of course the underlying data, the machine learning models and the diagnosis are, are completely different. Um, again, green, yellow, red, right, intuitive view. Um, the health is degraded. Uh, notice that the, uh, I would say, degradation and prediction here is nonlinear, right? It is not a, not a repetitive thing like a robotic. This is more a, a curvy linear prediction template. Um, and here we're diagnosing that specific harmonics or frequencies of the bearing are, are going to lead to the failure. For example, here, eight kilohertz band frequency is the key reason for this bearing to fail. But if you notice, we're also looking at the outer race of the bearing, the inner race of the bearing, the ball of the bearing, right? So some clients find it interesting to diagnose what is the inner component or issue of the bearing that is actually going to fail. And they use that to work with the bearing supplier, like SKF or, uh, or Timken or whoever supplies your bearings to, to make sure that they have the right bearing spec'd out and, and uh, basically uh, maximize the lifetime of the bearing within the machine. Stamping machines, okay. Within a stamping operation, um, we, uh, we do a lot of work with OEMs and tier ones in this area. Um, some stamping machines uh, are huge, like the Schulers and the Aidas and the Komatsus. Uh, some are more servo driven. Uh, some are smaller, more mechanical, 
hydraulic presses, right? So we've, we've had quite a few use cases here. Um, the idea here is predictive health modeling and, and detecting early signs of failure on the press. Um, this is uh, one of the most successful use cases we've done, um, where during a three-month pilot, uh, the solution actually detected two major stoppage events on the press. And one of the events was detected almost one month in advance. Um, and this was actually a benchmark project. So the, uh, the automotive company brought us in and provided a data set. And our solution was compared versus other solutions in the market. Um, and we provided the, the quickest speed to deploy and also the highest prediction accuracy. Uh, so we, we won this benchmark uh, in, in a good way. Um, this is the data model, okay? Um, there's different approaches to connect to a stamping press. Um, here is a more non-intrusive data model. We did not need any sensors to be mounted on the machine, actually. Uh, we just needed specific information around primarily the angle, the pressure, the temperature, and oil levels. And those three or four parameters were quite sufficient in this example. Um, in order to do more, I would say vibration sensing may be required on critical areas of the machine, uh, but we typically start in this non-intrusive way and just capture data from the PLC. Um, this is an example of the uh, hydraulic pressure and, uh, and uh, converting the hydraulic pressure into uh, a correlation with the press angle, okay? So this is the hydraulic pressure versus the press angle. Uh, we found that these are two very critical parameters to uh, monitor and, uh, and establish a baseline signature for a stamping press. Um, you'll notice the signal is quite noisy, right? So there are ways where we remove outliers and do signal processing. So this is the, the noisy signal and then the cleanse signal. So again, uh, it's important uh, to have, uh, you know, good data in drives good analytics out, right? Uh, so it's very important to apply signal processing analytics here. Uh, this is actually one of the use cases where we were able here uh, to drive um, within a one month heads up a, uh, an early indication of the failure on the press. Uh, but funny enough, uh, we were able to catch some early alarms uh, several months in advance. Okay, um, so these are the two events that I was referring to. Uh, this one was detected a few days in advance and this one was detected one month in advance. And this is the actual realization. Um, again, same user interface, intuitive, easy to use, easy to understand. Um, and over here, not shown here, but there was a prediction window of about a month that allowed this user, uh, this automotive company, to detect the early fault on the press. Um, they diagnosed it as a leakage event. So there was leakage on one of the critical areas on the press. Um, also, very interestingly, predictive alerts were sent out by email uh, to the maintenance organization. Um, and I think we had a tie into their, uh, their uh, Maximo environment. Uh, so they were able to quickly see the information uh, in their maintenance system. Uh, lastly, casting. Um, I want to be brief on this one. It's a, it's a very detailed uh, case study on predictive quality, actually, on a casting machine. Uh, that won the AI Leadership Award this year. And, and we'll be glad to maybe have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you if, if this relates to your environment. Um, but high pressure casting is, uh, is probably the most complex case study that I'm showing today. Um, this is a Bueller die cast cell with many, many, many critical components, okay? Um, and, and we believe in a less is more strategy, you know, 80-20 rule. So we started with 20% of these critical components, which indicated 80% of potential issues that are actually happening on the machine uh, regarding uptime and, uh, and quality. Um, we set up a data collection environment that is very scalable, okay? So the, uh, the camera on the machine together with the PLC data is coming through OPC, which then is used to drive different systems, right? So it is one data lake that is driving your MES, driving your traceability, and also driving our predictive solution. Uh, the data model was, it was a true big data project. Uh, we had over 50 data parameters. Um, I'm listing the key ones here. 
um, together with the three most critical components, uh, the accumulator, the squeeze pin, and the ejector were the first three that we analyzed and we successfully deployed. So there are the first three templates. But then we did expand the solution later to include the uh, ABB robotic here, the uh, trim press here, um, the die heater, and the dozing furnace. Um, so five or six most critical components on the uh, high, cast, high pressure cast cell. So then we started to look into airflow, pressure, temperature, and, and oil levels. Um, this is a simple view of the solution. This is actually a slide from, uh, from our customer uh, that, that indicates uh, the key ROI of the solution. Um, I'm just gonna briefly describe it. These are all the templates that are being captured, green, yellow, red. So green means that this is not related to the quality issue on the part. If you see a red, it means this parameter is being diagnosed as the parameter leading to the casting defect. Uh, and in addition to the yellows, which are more suspect, but, but typically the client would take the reds and the yellows and he would use these three parameters to, to indicate and diagnose that the defect that happened on the uh, aluminum casted part. Um, and then obviously you can click on it and go deeper into the actual metric and to understand uh, why the metric has impacted the, uh, the quality on the part. But, but the reason we refer to this as predictive quality is the AI is actually making decisions within six seconds. So it has to be faster than the cycle time of the part. The cycle time of the part is around 14 seconds. And not only that, but we're, we're prescribing and we're commanding the robot on the casting cell to actually automatically separate the part in a reject bin on the machine. So we're, we're taking the human element out of the equation here because they want to achieve a more lights out operation. And the solution within six seconds uh, for each part being produced is making a decision, good, suspect, or bad, green, yellow, red, and then for the yellows and the reds, it is making a decision to auto scrap the part uh, from the robotic on the machine, okay? So such a solution has really been able to deliver uh, in the beginning three to six months, somewhere between a 0.5% to a 1% scrap reduction. And it might sound like a small number, but that actually equated to over 200K per factory per year in annual savings for this, for this customer. So how do you get started in conclusion? I've, I've shown a lot of content and I wanted to keep it high level and brief because uh, I understand the audience who might be uh, here today or listening um, may have a robotic, may have a casting machine, may have stamping, may have CNC machines, right? So I wanted to show the breadth and depth of what we do. And I'm sorry if I missed the case study you're interested in. We have many more, including injection molding and, and many others uh, that we can cover maybe in a, in a future session or one-on-one. -on -one. But there is a very systematic way that we work with clients to deploy this today. And I wanna conclude and share that with you. Um, it is important in your analytics journey to find your proof of value, okay? And it's good to think big, but we like to recommend starting small, proving value, and then scaling fast using the templates that I've shown some to you today. So we have a 3D approach. We discover, we design, we deliver, and we run this approach very quickly, keeping the business case in mind. We start with complementary assessments, okay? We do discoveries, we visit the plants, we jump on calls. Uh, obviously, we've been doing a lot of calls lately. Um, and we, in many cases, the customer may have data. They share the data with us under NDA. And we actually run an analysis on that data, complementary, to, to show the user that there is value from the predictive analytics on their own data set. Okay? So this assessment process leads to a selection of a template that makes sense to the user or multiple templates and then actually performing a technical workshop, a design workshop to review the current factory technologies, data collection strategy, and very importantly, to document the business case and ROI that we want from such a uh, solution template. So there's a gap analysis, people process technology, right? And there's a statement of work around the needed hardware, if required, and the software and the services. 
and this paves the path to a proof of value. A proof of value is where we technically deploy a solution template on multiple assets, okay? Three robotics, four robotics, whatever it takes. We give user training and system admin training, especially for the maintenance organization, and we track the ROI and usage of the data over time. This leads to success when the ROI is achieved and the technology works and proves the value. And then in many cases, we, depending on the size of our customer, uh, we can train the client themselves to own those templates and then subscribe to the tool and roll those templates out in their manufacturing operation. And in many cases, they, they can do it themselves. So we, we refer to this as a center of excellence strategy, uh, COE environment, where many of our users, uh, key clients, can actually take those templates that have been already proven and roll them out. Um, this process doesn't take years. This process takes weeks and months. Um, it's a one, two, three process. There is a one day to do the assessment, uh, which is maybe scattered uh, across several phone calls. Um, there's a two-day workshop that is typically done on site. And then there's a three-month proof of value that is done uh, on the critical assets that are selected. And uh, this whole process can, can easily be completed under six months, uh, allowing those templates to be then scaled uh, by the user or by us to, to, the, to the global or the local manufacturing facilities. So in conclusion, um, Start your digital transformation journey today. Um, it's good to think big, uh, but it's more important to start small, act now, and prove value. Um, we collaborate with our, our clients to make predictive analytics operational, starting with a proof of value, okay, and always keeping the business case in mind. Um, we always help assist our clients to, to achieve and go towards a zero downtime, zero defect journey with us. Uh, by connecting and, and using analytics within their factories. Um, I didn't speak today about smart connected products. We have a lot of good work happening in this area, uh, monitoring of, uh, of pumps and bearings in the field and, and even around connected vehicle applications. Um, that could be a good discussion for the future. Um, and, and lastly, uh, you know, Industry 4.0 and analytics fundamentally relates to people, process, and technology at the end of the day. And benefits usually accrue as far as the weakest link. So we understand uh, you know, various plans have various levels of digital maturity, and we work uh, collaboratively with our clients and, and, and customers to find the, the best area within the plant or the best area within the organization to pilot such solutions, keeping that maturity in mind so that people, process, and technology can be harmonized and can help generate a quick win, right? Uh, winning with AI uh, to your manufacturing environment. So I will, uh, I will stop here and uh, I will see if anyone has any questions. Um, I'm unmuting Dr. Dimitris. Um, and we'll look in the chat window and see if any questions came through. Uh, if you have any questions, please, please type them in the chat window um, or send them to me as the host. We have about uh, five minutes. Any questions, anybody? Maybe if you could type them, or if you prefer to speak, we can also enable you. All you have to do is type your name in the chat, and then Mo will allow you to speak if you have a specific question. And of course, uh, the recording will be provided to the team together with the presentation. And uh, um, a call to action here is uh, if anyone on the call wants uh, a deeper dive into any of those templates or other templates that we have not shown today. Um, we'd be glad to do that with you. Uh, it takes less, uh, less than 30 minutes on a discovery call and we can cover uh, more information on some of those templates. I think in general, a question I, I usually get um, is around uh, connectivity. Um, if I'm asked what is the usually the biggest challenge or kind of prerequisite to make all this work, 
it's really the connectivity and uh, getting the data needed to drive the analytics. Um, so it's important that we, we do assess the plant and the machine. And uh, if needed, add sensors to the process, especially with older machines. Um, and uh, that helps drive the, uh, the analytics. So we have an automation team that excels in controls, engineering, and sensors, and um, they're able to um, help get the data quickly, and that this drives that three-month process very quickly. Well, I guess um, if we don't have any questions officially, I would like to thank everybody for participating. And just to reiterate, uh, as Mo indicated, this is recorded. If you believe anyone else in your organization would benefit from it, please let us know. We will make sure they get a link to it. And as Mo indicated, uh, if you have any other questions or you want to discuss in detail any of the templates we spoke about or any custom machines, sometimes we have clients that have a very specialized piece of equipment that is very critical to their operation and we can assist them in, in such a project. So with that, I think Mo, we can uh, close this uh, and um, see what we get afterwards. Absolutely. Um, we'll share the uh, presentation and the link with everyone and especially those who may have missed it. Uh, and we do appreciate your time. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, stay healthy and uh, we look forward to a future conversation. And uh, Dimitris and the Charlton team, thank you very much for hosting this. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Have a good day. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye.